Hi everyone. So good to see so many of you joining today. Um, my name is Eva and I am the Chief of Operations here at Glitch. I work as Shay Akiwawa's second in command and I am so excited and honoured to be opening and closing the launch of our Digital Misogynoir report launch today. Glitch are joining you today from the Advocacy Academy in Brixton, London. Um, so a shout out and a big thank you to them for letting us use this space today. So for those of you who are not familiar with the work of Glitch and our mission, we are an award-winning UK charity committed to ending online abuse and making the internet a safer space for everyone, particularly women and unapologetically centering black women. We are recognized internationally for mainstreaming the conversation on online abuse and digital citizenship. And we are transforming how tech companies build and scale social media platforms so that they have women's safety and joy in mind. From delivering workshops, training, and resources to communities around the world, to a trailblazing research reports like the one we have today, and power change making campaigns like the online safety bill, and working with global brands, we're here to help make digital citizens of everyone. We're really, really grateful that you've taken the time to be here tonight. The Digital Misogynoir Report is a really important development for Glitch. It offers evidence of what Black women have been saying for years. Black women, there are specific and persistent harms that come with being online as a Black woman, and tech companies and government just really are not doing enough. The Digital Misogynoir Report expands the very small but very important evidence base of the intersectional impacts of online abuse. This document, um, this documents the alarming prevalence of digital misogynoir across five major social media channels, and it puts forward tangible actions to help drive meaningful change. At this point, I'd like to thank and shout out Gabriella Dolivera, who's managed to join us today, and Dr. Julia Slipska from Glitch, and Lydia Okori and Elizabeth Capon from Texgain, who I hope are able to join us online today, who lead us, who led on this landmark piece of research that we'll be exploring today. I'd also like to thank the European AI and Society Fund, who helped with some of the funding of the support. Without them, we would have been completely self-funding this. And it's rare to find funders willing to support this kind of work directly. So thank you so much. There are so many people to thank, but in the interest of not taking up too much time at this point, I won't reel through all of them, but many will be mentioned during the course of this evening. Of course, I'd like to thank all of you for joining today. And I know that we have some former Glitch colleagues and trustees and friends of Glitch and media and academia and so many others joining us today. So welcome. And I imagine that over the course of the next few minutes or so, or over the course of the evening, we'll have people joining us. But I do know that over 200 people signed up for today, which is amazing. I also know there are quite a few people that haven't been able to make it. Um, and I hope they don't have too much FOMO, uh, but they shouldn't worry because this is being recorded. So, to get on with this evening, my colleague, Dr. Julia, will take you through all of the key findings and actions in just a moment. But I want to say here that our work means we often confront violent language of dehumanizing posts online. And so we've embedded a trauma-informed approach into the work we do at Glitch. And that means that we take our emotional and our physical safety seriously, and we take yours seriously too. For example, our Digital Misogynoir Report has some necessary screenshots that contextualize the toxicity that Black women face online, but we won't be sharing those posts here tonight. Throughout the Digital Misogynoir Report, you'll see content warnings and calls to practice self-care. There are moments for readers to take a break, to breathe, <laughs> to recalibrate, and we've created that same framework in this event. So alongside the key findings, which reflect the urgency of tackling on digital misogynoir, we've also invited poet Victoria Adukwe Bully to help create a moment for reflection, decompression, and tenderness as we think about how we'd like to move forward together after tonight. And then our founder and CEO, Shay Akiwowo, will be in conversation with the creator and host of Busy Being Black, Josh Rivers, about the way Black women pursue joy and community by utilizing the very technological innovations that harm them. Okay, so before we launch in, <laughs> a few housekeeping points. Um, we can't see the videos of all the attendees today, um, but we, like I mentioned earlier, do want to let you know that this is being recorded. We record for posterity and to help create content in support of our work at Glitch. 
but even though you're not in video, please do interact with us using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions about the report and its findings. And we'll have some time towards the end to answer some of those questions. We'll be sending links for the report and other important information after the event. So I'm about to hand over to Julia. Thank you again so much for being here. I hope you have a wonderful time and enlightening time. And my colleague, Dr. Julia, will now share more information about the Digital Misogynoir Report, including its key findings and its recommendations. See you later. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia, and for the past few months, I have been working on co-authoring this report. So I'm going to talk very briefly uh, about the background of the report, the methods, the findings, and the calls to action in the report. Um, but I won't have a lot of time to go into the details. So if you are interested, please do download it. It is now up on our website. And if there's anything you want to find out more information about, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So before I begin, I wanted to say in terms of positionality, um, I want to acknowledge that both as a co-author and as a speaker here, I am a white woman communicating harms impacting Black women, as well as women in general. Um, and I try to approach this with a mindset of solidarity, so keeping an awareness both that I don't have lived experience of misogynoir um, and that the burden of challenging this problem should not be carried only by those worst affected by it. So, um, as we discussed in the report, misogynoir is a term coined by Dr. Moya Bailey to acknowledge the ways Black women are uniquely discriminated against because of their gender and race. Um, digital misogynoir, which is what we focus on in the report, is the continued unchecked and often violent dehumanization of Black women on social media, as well as through other forms of, uh, such as algorithmic discrimination. So, Digital misogynoir is particularly dangerous because of its ability to incite offline violence. There have been multiple recorded cases of people um, consuming this content online and that leading to white supremacist shootings against Black people, against immigrants and other people of color. And Black women have been raising the alarm on digital misogynoir for years. This is not a new issue. But despite this, the majority of online safety research and policy across civil society, government and tech companies continues to ignore the specific compounding racialized and gendered nature of online harms uh, with relatively sparse work focusing on digital misogynoir. So a lot of online harms, online safety work doesn't explicitly address identity factors or it will include only one factor. So for example, focusing only on gender, uh, which often results in generalizing from white women's experiences to those of all women. Um, and to kind of respond to that, to fill that gap, this report draws on the long tradition of black feminist scholarship and activism to provide a statistical analysis as well as a qualitative analysis of digital misogynoir. And sort of the main motivation for this is to make sure that black women don't need to keep retelling and reliving their trauma. Uh, we want to kind of add to this evidence base. Um, and in terms of the methods that we used with the support of TextGain, which is a company that uses automated tools to detect hate speech, we collected and analyzed a data set of almost a million posts from five major social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Gab, and 4chan, uh, which makes this study the first that we know of to examine digital misogynoir across multiple online platforms using these kinds of quantitative methods. So to detect toxicity, TextGain created a dictionary with uh, thousands of words and phrases, which are then labeled by human annotators with toxicity categories, so like racism, sexism, religious hate, and so forth, and then a toxicity score. So an algorithm will then use these tags from human annotators to assign scores to messages, and this allowed us to detect and compare toxic content across thousands of posts and various categories and platforms. Moving on to our key findings. Uh, firstly, misogynoir and misogyny more generally were incredibly prevalent across all of the five platforms that we studied. So out of the almost 1 million posts about women that we collected, over 20%, so one in five, were highly toxic. This amounts to over 1,000 highly toxic posts per day in the time period studied. In general, any posts about women were significantly more toxic than the average social media post. But specifically, we found over 9,000 more highly toxic posts about Black women than white women. And in many ways, the data set highlights the way that Black women are more likely to be racialized, which means they're more likely to be referred in reference to their race or ethnicity. What we think the kind of scale of these findings shows is that these companies could be doing so much more to moderate content to limit and prevent hate. 
um, but they've made an active choice to scale up quickly without putting effective safety measures in place and putting profits over people. So secondly, we focus in the report on the ways that hateful tropes continue to be used to silence and harm Black women. Um, dehumanizing language and stereotypes that have long been critiqued within Black feminist scholarship, things like the angry Black woman, fetishization, and fat phobia are incredibly rife in digital spaces. The most prevalent misogynoir trope that we found in our data set was the angry Black woman, which is extremely harmful because it's used to silence um, and tone police Black women, particularly when they speak out about misogynoir. Um, but despite these very high rates of toxicity and toxic content, we also found relatively high rates of positive content about Black women. So in that we see the power and joy of Black online communities and how social media can and is used to challenge abuse and celebrate Black women. Um, lastly, we talk uh, in the report about the ways that misogynoir underpins broader hateful theories like white supremacy, anti-Semitism, conspiracy theories like great replacement theory, which claims that people of color are replacing uh, the white race through immigration. And this again has been linked to violence against immigrants, against people of color. So in our data set, even abuse aimed at white women was often based on demeaning other races, for example, through racist vitriol against mixed race couples in which white women are seen as betraying the white race. And terms like the Great Replacement are steadily trickling from these alternative platforms like Gab, like 4chan, which are known havens for white supremacists, back into the mainstream platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, where they're much they're able to reach much broader audiences. So for example, TextGain found that there's been a 690% increase in the use of Great Replacement as a phrase on Twitter since 2017. So, um, we have a variety of calls to action in the report for tech companies, for governments, and for research and civil society, and then for communities and digital citizens. But just to zoom in on a couple of them, because I won't have time to cover all of them. We're calling on tech companies to include misogynoir, misogyny, and racism, and white supremacy in their policies on online safety and content moderation. We're calling on governments and citizens to hold companies accountable to this. Um, and to that end, we're going to be um, creating a campaign. So please do sign up to Glitch's newsletter to join our upcoming campaigns on this. Um, and I think to close off, it's worth reiterating here that Glitch is just one small charity and there was a lot of limitations in the data that we were able to access. We know that the algorithm probably underestimates the levels of toxicity. And really, we are doing the research that tech companies should be doing in the first place, because they're the ones that have all of this data. They're the ones that have created and profited from the platforms that are allowing this level of toxicity to take place online. So if we're able to find this much misogynoir, despite the barriers to data access that companies have erected and are continuing to erect to prevent transparency, then we can imagine that the scale of digital misogynoir is much greater than what we found. So. We hope this research is a starting point. We hope it sheds, highlights the problem, but there's a lot more work to be done. These findings make it very clear that there can be no online safety uh, for anyone, so long as Black women continue to face such vitriol and violence, both online and offline. So before I go and hand over, I'd just like to remind you all that we have time for questions later. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We're also uh, very keen to know what stands out to you about the findings of this report. That's been really interesting for us to hear what resonates across our community. So please do fill out the short survey at the end of the webinar. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to a conversation between Shea Akiwowo, the Glitch founder and CEO, and Josh Rivers, creator and host of the award-winning podcast, Busy Being Black. Thank you, Julia, so much for um, taking us through the Digital Misogynoir Report's findings. My name is Josh Rivers. I am the creator and host of the award-winning podcast, Busy Being Black. Uh, I usually uh, have conversations and central conversations uh, with queer Black people about what it means to live and thrive at the intersection of our identities. I also often have conversations with Black women, regardless of sexuality and gender identity, to, because Black women's experiences in the world offer us always insightful ways of reimagining and reengaging with the world around us. I'm particularly thrilled 
to convene a conversation with Shay Akiwowo, uh, a friend and someone I admire a great deal and someone who's actually been a guest on Busy Being Black before. Shay, uh, welcome to this conversation as part of your uh, launch for the Digital Misajima Report. As you know, <laughs> as you know, I'm Busy Being Black. To open all of my conversations, I ask all of my guests the same question. How's your heart? Uh, as the youth would say, I'm feeling all the feels. Um, you can hear me all good. Um, I'm feeling all the feels. Um, to see 107 participants on this webinar, Zoom call, um, to have this report out um, after years of battling and convincing funders that this is not a niche market, that this is important work, um, the hurdles and the hardships and collaborations and all of that, like it's been a long time coming. And I, when I, when I say like, this is one of my career highlights, I genuinely mean it. Like my heart is full with appreciation and gratitude to the team to the point where I'm gonna stop here before I now get emotional. Um, but I am because obviously Glitch starts uh, start, started with my experience of digital misogyny world, which wasn't available language to me back then. And so the fact that there is such a validating report for not just me, but for many other Black women who are online that are just trying to be authentically themselves, I have so much appreciation and gratitude. But as we know, two truths can exist. I also feel a bit of impatience and frustration because it took a lot of convincing to get here. It took a lot of... Um, uh, self-funding and our own income generation to match what we were able to get fundraised for this and as Dr Julia said earlier like we're such a small team to have done this and it'd be one of the first out there so I've got a real impatience of wanting to see what people can do with this but that does then make me feel really hopeful and excited to hear where people take this report where it's talked about in schools where it's talked about in safeguarding where it's talked about what at work and in policy spaces. And I'm really excited to hopefully see that other forms of glitches, whatever they may be, ex ex grow from this report and people feel really validated to want to focus on black women. Yeah, and shout out to the Glitch team. I've had the honor of, of uh, bearing witness to the work that you all do together. And it, it really is a, a remarkable team doing a remarkable amount of work. There's two points I wanna draw you out on, Shay. Um, and the first, we can we can get into this later, but the first, I, I guess I really wanna draw drive home is that this is almost a million text-based messages over a period of time between, uh, I think it's June last year and January this year. But a million text-based messages is is infinitesimal, right? If we're thinking about the scale of uh, social media posts that go out every single day, so I, I guess I'm just trying to imagine this toxicity at scale, right? This what Glitch has uncovered is is like lifting up one pebble and finding, <laughs> you know, a, a little bit of dirt. But, but this is a huge problem. Um, that I think that this points to. Do I, do I have that right, that the scale here is something that we also really need to consider when looking at this report? Yeah, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we've been able to see. And we know that API access is also under threat by a lot of tech companies right now, and um, particularly, particularly one, Twitter. And we know that not enough tech companies also um uh, allow API access. So this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we've been able to see. And it is really, really horrific. And as platforms are trying to grow and expand and to scale, they really need to be thinking about misogynoir on, uh, on how that may look in different contexts, in different regional parts of the world, in different languages. Like, there is so many limitations to this report. And this is not a like self like flagellating kind of thing. It's a like, this is just the start. There is so much more that can be done. Um, and I look forward to seeing like a version of this report in Yoruba, in Portuguese, in, in, in Italian, um, to be able to really understand the venom that Dr. Moya talks about, like the venom in which Ms. Lodrenoir, um displays itself and grows. And I think what was most disappointing was how many of this um these bits of content was st still existed on the platform a year later so it was it felt like 
a bit of a kick in the teeth that it was okay for this kind of content to stay on the platform. Yes, we know some platforms may opt to use deamplification tools rather than a takedown, but it still felt that there was a tolerance to allowing that kind of punch down dehumanizing language to stay on our online, online platform, our online community. And the second point I want to raise is around is linked to your personal experience. You just said, you know, there wasn't the language of digital massage noir when Glitch started off the back of this traumatic experience that you had in the public space that you had online. And so as someone who's been doing this work, as someone who's who's helped change the game, as it were, around how people are talking about online safety, not just in the UK, but around the world. What, if anything, stands out to you about the findings in this report? I'll tell you what stands out to me. I was blown away by the connection between massage noir, great replacement theory, anti-Semitism, and general white supremacist hate. And I don't know why, I still haven't been able to, to metabolize why that stands out to me so much, but I think it's that no matter where you look, no matter who the hate is directed at, there's hate against black women and rolled up in that. I think that really stands out to me. What stands out to you about this report? Yeah, I don't think, anything really surprised me but it was very validating very loud very amplified so I too was like oh my god look at how much this web of hate is so interconnected and it's why I and a lot of people have been trying to push conversations around dismantling white supremacy and social justice to be about multi-directional solidarity to be about allyship and not to feed into this division that I think a lot of us are seeing in um, the charity sector, in feminist movements, in community mobilizing, and not feeding into this like oppression Olympics. And so there was a point that um, Gabby, who was leading the report before going on leave, um, showed us a word cloud of all the highly toxic content and all the highly toxic things that were said. And it was a word cloud connecting anti-Semitism with fat phobia, with transphobia, with colorism, with colonialism. And it was like, this is the word cloud of white supremacy. This is the, the beast and the oppressor that we need to all come together against and um, the importance of, of community. I think the other thing that was really amplified by the report and the findings was how organized and deliberate these actors are. And I think we often use quite trivial words to explain racism online. It's ignorant people. It's people saying things they won't say to your face. Some people do now. Um, I think actually this report shows that this is organized. This is like they've got their own pigeon language. They are all creating a whole new way to talk talk about this fear of being replaced and there's a lot of grooming happening and as you said Josh there's a punching down um towards black women every single time like black women particularly dark-skinned black women at the heart of this and I think that was so amplified in this report and why I really do hope that this means that we don't have to spend the little time many people have um, talking to policymakers, talking to policy shapers, talking to tech companies, that little half an hour, one hour window slot that you get to do some advocacy. I hope this report will mean that they're not spending the majority of that time convincing them or teaching them what misogyny war is, what gender-based violence is. Like this report hopefully draws a line to say like, you all now know, no more willful ignorance now, let's do this properly. So much of the work that you do is intersectional in its approach. And I think it's it's perhaps a good thing that we're seeing intersectionality spoken about so much more publicly, so much more often. With that comes a natural slippage, right? So for example, in the LGBTQ spaces I operate in, we often see intersectionality used as a synonym for diversity, which drives me nuts. Um, and so I think it's important to point to examples of intersectionality in action, in the offline world and the online world. And I think, you know, Glitch is a really wonderful example of that. What does Glitch's work teach us about intersectional organizing and action? Uh, firstly, that it's hard. <laughs> like, I think it's really nice for us to be in our 
online spaces, our community forums, in our safe safe havens, talking about you know our, our our dreams and hopes and imaginations for the future. That is very important when it comes to resistant work and activism and campaigning. But putting the theory into practice is really hard because this world is so binary. Um, this world doesn't can't see that two truths can exist, let alone intersect. So I think it's about acknowledging that yes, it's hard, but I think glitch of the last six years and three years as a charity has shown that it is possible. And if we can do it on a shoestring budget, starting in my mom's house, <laughs> in my childhood home, then like a lot of us can get to grips with how we can embed intersectionality as an approach. I think it's about Glitch has had to work a lot about being, work on being pragmatic as well. So actually um, Dr. Julia was in our orbit um, before starting at Glitch when we commissioned and asked Julia to help us talk about intersectionality as part of our campaign um, with the online safety bill without saying the word intersectionality. So it wouldn't turn off the more conservative people in the room who we have to influence. And so I think there is like, ways in which we have been able to embed our theory and our hope and our heart's desires but being pragmatic and meeting people where they are without compromising i think another thing that glitch has done over the years is being more and more proud of how we unapologetically center black women and by centering black women we're also saying it means we can't center other people but that does not mean that we're in opposition to each other we shouldn't get into this scarcity mindset about funding and let's work together against the common enemy then now think that one person's work is more important and i think by that has meant that we're working with more trans communities that are focused on trans on trans people it means that we're working with um jewish communities and charities who are focused on those people and meaning that we are working on our strengths together they're now trying to like dilute our own mission to try and be everything which is i think also a problem of the charity sector but that's for another conversation um and i think black feminist digital principles, which is something we've been talking about at Glitch um, for a while now, is about resisting the ways in which white supremacy working can, set, can, can, can mean that you're organizing and working and, and, and culture. So taking time to not feed into the urgency and be reactive and taking time to make sure that you have got your ducks in, your row, in the row and we are being inclusive and we are putting like um, captions on our social media posts as much as we can. I think as we've been more intentional about our principles and about our values, it's allowed us to be more creative about what is possible, while, like I said before, being pragmatic. Um, I do think, though, that if we want to step into more intersectional work and, um, and embedding it as an approach, we need more resources and we need more funding for from philanthropies, um, from philanthropists, sorry, who are going to fund people looking at intersecting identities and not, as you said, see it as a tick box in an exercise and a new like DNI thing to report on. Um, but I, I'm really excited that it's become more mainstream. So it's not a convert. It's a it's gone, the conversations move beyond like let's explain intersectionality to like how can we do it and I and maybe in a year's time when we maybe come back and talk about how the report's been landing with people, we will see other ways in which people are building on intersectionality as an approach and bringing other people in, in allyship and community rather than now trying to like monopolize all the different social justice issues. I get that. Um, we have a conversation outline just for transparency. I'm jumping around a little bit, just gonna make sure that we get these most salient points in, in the time that we have. I spent a lot of time working, as I've said before, in the LGBTQ human rights space. And when I was working for Kaleidoscope Trust, the international LGBTQ human rights charity, I was in conversation with an activist um, working in uh, providing shelter and safer spaces and learning and education opportunities for women who had experienced intimate partner violence. And when I asked her how her work had shifted and changed over the years, she told me that she's begun extending her work to young boys. And she's she's met a lot of resistance in that. But her goal, she says, is to you know intervene before boys become men who harm women. And that she sees that as part of like an ecosystem 
um, that she can contribute to, to help her overall mission to create safe, safer spaces in a safer world for women. Um, how might you begin to talk about some of the larger issues that intersect with the work of Glitch? And, and I guess I mean by that, that are gonna continue to impact um, the work of Glitch and the mission to end online abuse, um, um, unless people keep their foot on the gas in, in changing these things. I don't know if it's because I'm Nigerian, um, but I hate inefficiency. Like it's in my, from before I've been able to spell my own name, like things have to be quick, kya kya, no dulling, no wasting time. So I can't not see why people don't use intersectionality as an approach because it is just the most efficient way to spend limited resources when it comes to social justice. Um, and I think that, that upbringing, plus then going to a university like LSE where everything is up for questioning. You, you have to ask why on the why on the why, the causes of things, um, then made me want to understand why are people abusive online? And I don't think that online abuse actually is the starting point but it's the symptom of a wider issue that we have in society and why at glitch we're so deliberate about our language when we say the online world and the offline world rather than the real world because it's one continuum and we need the two worlds to reinforce each other um, for the better and I think it's through all of that kind of questioning and the why and the pulling and being focused on systemic change, because I'm really clear at Glitch, the team will tell you this, I don't want us to become a frontline service. There, there is always a demand and a pull to do more workshops and trainings and, and, and um, meet people where they are. At, but we want to balance that with dealing with this systemically. So I think asking all of that why I'm pulling and prodding and also been asked loads of questions when I get to speak and deliver trainings and stuff made me think that actually the, the root evil of all of this, yes, it's my supremacy, but is in terms of solution is what is the public health approach to why people are thinking that they need to be abusive online, why people are more susceptible to grooming online. And one thing I talk about in my book, How to Stay Safe Online, was my fear that when, if we don't deal with people who are victims and survivors of online abuse, that they may become perpetrators because we know that hurt people hurt people. That doesn't happen all the time, but it's a concern that I have. And so if we can, if we can look at some of the offline causes of online abuse, which is decolonizing our education, it's investing in mental health, it's it's um, having a conversation about race, because we can't be allies online and digital citizens online if we're not, if we're dickheads offline, like that is, doesn't make sense. So I, so I think public health approach is a way in which we can be efficient, we can look systemically at the issues, because I hate repeating myself. Maybe that's also a Nigerian thing. For those that don't know, Shei is short for the for um, Oluwashi, and um, it's very much like God done this for me. So like, why are you wasting time? So I think it's very ingrained in me that I don't see why we would now go from dealing with online abuse and Andrew Tate and our deep fakes and then this and that. Like, let's broaden out and let's look at who's the dickheads that are causing this and let's address that first. So that's where the public health approach stuff came came in. And obviously the policy team make that more of a policy language that is acceptable to use than obviously the word dickhead. Yeah, and, and dickhead is a is is an interesting euphemism for a public health approach. And I, I think that I might start using that myself. Um because I quite like that. And you know, I've worked in sexual health as well. And I guess as a gay man in the 21st century as well, I know very well. Um, and understand rather intimately this kind of whole person care approach that certain segments of um, the gay community have been able to utilize to our benefit, right? This understanding that it's it's not just a service provision or prep in this one space, but that it also has to be a conversation about mental health, about sexual violence, that it has to be a, a kind of more comprehensive approach. And the public health approach stood out to me as well, because I don't think that public health and online safety are natural bedfellows in the public imagination. Yeah, no, I think that's why Glitch is one of a kind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, I think I borrowed that kind of learning from my politician days, 
uh, I call myself a recovering politician. It's I've been out of politics longer than I was in it and I'm still recovering. So that shows you the state of our politics. But I borrowed it from um, that life because I was really passionate about youth uh, violence or obviously stopping youth violence and that's why I got involved in politics and there was lots of conversations around a public health approach to tackling youth violence so obviously not just enforcement not just in increasing policing budget but looking at education looking at therapy looking at psychological support looking at income and money and it was massively fascinating and then also a second kind of interest of mine was um domestic violence and like what does a public health approach look like look like and actually framing de domestic violence as a public health cost was also quite fascinating to read and I and I again going back to the efficiency let's be let's be efficient with our time um I was like how can we borrow some of that framework and learning when it comes to tech accountability and justice so we're not waiting for we're not waiting 10 years to get to that conversation let's borrow that language and that framework now let's let's learn from their movement their organizing their resistance now so that we can be using that as we um imagine to different types of policies that we want around digital citizenship around online abuse specifically around digital misogyny and war, but also just healthy citizens if we are healthy offline we're going to be more likely to be healthy online and if we've got more healthy communities online because I think a lot of us will say like we're better people for those that we get to meet online that also translate off offline so I think um, having the breathing space and to borrow concepts and frameworks from other movements and resistance that has worked really well is something that is really important if we're going to try and beat multi-billion pound for profit making companies we don't have time on our side to like keep waiting keep experiment well we want experimentation definitely we want creativity but I don't think we have time to kind of wait for people to catch up like oh yes women are disproportionately impacted oh yes that's going to impact black women like we don't have time for you to get it because black women are being harmed right now <laughs> Yeah, and th this isn't brand new information, right? And it seems it's only ever with black people that this is all brand new information. Um, <laughs> slavery was bad, what? Like, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad news. Um, we have time for one more question before we hand over to um, our, our poet for the evening. Um, there's a growing um, awareness that pleasure is an important part of the work that we're doing in liberation movements. And I'm thinking of Adrian Marie Brown's pleasure activism um, in particular, but also going back to Audre Lorde's the uses of the erotic, right? This understanding that there is a power in our erotic lives, erotic selves that, that we can weaponize. Um, and this is all work of imagination, right? Patrice Cullors said a few years ago that someone imagined chains, someone imagined death, it's our job to imagine someone else. And I bring all this up to say, that I think that online abuse, my, my, my hunch is that online abuse just feels so par for the course, right? It's, it's acute, it's, it's bad, but I don't know that we think that the online space can be any different. If we think about Twitter, we have no hopes for Twitter, right? We have, we have no hopes that that space is gonna be anything different than what it's become. So one could say that you and the team at Glitch are in an imagination battle, right? How are you imagining um, a different online space. So what's helping you engage your imagination about what the pleasure, about what the internet could be? And how does a pleasure-filled future inform the work that you and the team at Glitch do? Yeah, I love that question because I think one thing that the report also shows is how many Black communities are online and joy and expressing joy and being them being their authentic self and that is really amazing to see which is why we need to make sure we we protect those communities and we have all platforms so not just those that are mentioned in the report but all those that are um second generation and coming up um making sure that they are allowing black joy to thrive i think at glitch in order to center pleasure um and keep reimagining it's how we work as well that is really important so we do a lot of things to like push against urgency like reading week admin week connecting with our values 
um, been able to like go on training and learn from other people from different parts of the world when on organizing on tech rights from a gendered lens. I think that that gives us breathing time to like get grounded again and not get caught up in the reactivity of the world and their rhythm and their their cycle. We very, very much have our own rhythm and cycle. And that was important to get right. And that was important in terms of accountability so that we weren't, as Audrey Lord said, using the master's tools to try and dismantle the house. So there was a really good thread recently by um, Equinox Racial Justice that talked about the NGOization of resistance. And it chimes with the book that dragged me. It, this book dragged me so much, I haven't finished reading it. I've only read the first two pages because it happened at the same time as the death of George, the death and murder of George Floyd. And a lot more abolitionist work was being uh, amplified. And this book, the feminist, it's called Feminist Accountability, Disrupting Violence and Transforming. And it basically says that uh, a lot of well-meaning people set up organizations and NGOs and charities to only perpetuate white supremacy. Um, and this thread I mentioned also does, says that. And that therefore meant to, for me that I needed to put in real building blocks and boundaries and parameters to make sure that we did not get consumed by the world that we are trying to change. And that and that part of that meant that we now have an anti-carceral approach at Glitch. We try very we try very hard to convince other organizations that the own that sending people to prison isn't the only solution. And so I think that therefore those those parameters of time out, pausing, connecting as a team, looking at getting dragged by other books about accountability, about setting up the organization right, means there is a protective space for imagination and pleasure. Just before we came here, we were at WeWork and the team and I were drinking rum punch. So we're very much people about, we need to embody the, the, the world that we wanna see. We need to be the recovering dickheads we want of digital citizens. Um, and I think that's how we keep, uh, how I keep coming up with wacky ideas and taking them to the team. And then you can see the senior leaders like, okay, we're gonna do this now because I get the time to be able to connect with the ancestors, connect with my body, connect with nature and see that actually this system of oppression that we get duped in isn't the only model that we have to be in. And it also helps when you get to see um, movies like Marvel, um, you get to read, read poetry and listen to podcasts where people are rethinking and challenging the status quo, which is why going back to the intersectional approach is so important because it allows us to push what is the norm. It allows us to bring in queerness, it allows us to challenge, it allows us to hold two truths. And all of that is such good, like right building blocks for pleasure and reimagination, I think. Jay, thank you so much for your insights in this conversation. Uh, for attendees, we'll have more time with Shay during our Q and A. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce um, our poet for the evening, Victoria Aduque Bully, whose work has appeared widely in publications including the White Review, the London Review of Books, and the Atlantic. She is the winner of an Eric Gregory Award, and her critically acclaimed debut poetry collection, Quiet, won the Rathbones Folio Prize for Poetry, the John Pollard International Poetry Prize, and was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. Quiet is published by Favor and Favor in the UK and in North America by Knopf Penguin Random House. Victoria, welcome to the Glitch Misogynoir Report launch. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. I don't know if I'm visible. I can't seem to start my camera. Can someone uh, do that for me? It's not letting me. There we go. Okay, I can't see myself. Um, <laughs> am I visible? Yep, we can see you now. Fantastic. Um, hi. Um, hi, everyone. I just want to begin by saying um the biggest thank you to Shay, to Josh um and to Paquita who got me involved in this in the beginning um but um this has just been such a 
fascinating and thorough and rigorous um, session and it feels so necessary. I I loved what Shay has been really um, hammering home about this sense of let's not waste time trying to to outline this idea of mis misogynoir as a thing. Um, it's such a waste of time and especially considering that in the online space and in the real world, um, you know, the physical, tangible, outdoors, real world, um, it's, it's never really been in question that as a black woman, particularly as a darker skinned black woman, it's, it's always in some way open season if you step out of line. Um, and I guess as we become an increasingly more digital world, um, the safeties that we are seeking out in the real world are the same safeties that we're seeking um, online. I won't say too much more. I'm just going to try and read some poems, but I just wanted to express my gratitude um, at, at this and for the chance to be part of it. So thank you, Glitch. I'm going to read two poems, just keep it quick. And um, they're from my collection, which is called Quiet. I can see my screen is a bit blurred, but <laughs> it's called Quiet. Um, and it was published last year. And I think maybe why this is relevant in some way is that the collection is very much about the interior and the, spa the spaces within the self that are safe, um, particularly for the black female subject. And um, thinking about the internet as a kind of semi-interior makes that even more interesting. So I'll start with a poem called The Ultra Black Fish. The Ultra Black Fish. 200 meters down, the light stops. Many deep sea creatures alive at this level of the ocean have developed the ability to create light for themselves. This is known as bioluminescence. Others, on the contrary, contribute to the darkness by adding themselves to it. Ultra Blackfish are one example and, in 2020, 16 varieties of these were captured. The level of pigment in their skin was so high that it was found to absorb 99.956 of the light that touched it. Karen, a marine biologist, came across them by accident. Instead of hauling up the deep sea crabs she had been searching for, her net produced a fang-toothed fish that wouldn't show up in a photograph. Held later in a tank under two strobe lights, the fish became a living black hole with no discernible features beyond the opacity of its silhouette. As though it had cut itself out of the image and left. Scientists believe that the fish develops their invisibility to aid them in escaping their predators. Another theory suggests that the obscurity of ultra black fish enables them to more successfully catch their prey. It is likely that both ideas are true. Commentators have also speculated that the chemical structure of the pigment could serve the development of military and defense technologies. Nothing was said, however, about how ultra black fish find and enter into relations with each other. Nonetheless, their existence alone is evidence that invisible as they may be to others, they are by no means strangers to themselves. And um, I will close now because I know we don't have that much time 
with a poem that's very much about um, how we treat each other in the world and how care can be expressed in the smallest of actions um, in the most minute of ways. So this poem is outwardly about a snail, but you know, it's not, it's not just about snails or snails. Of the snail and its loveliness. Once I saw a snail so small, so young, its shell was still transparent. I stopped to look. I had the time to see a thing unseen before, a tiny flute, a ghost of white that swayed within the sleeping shell, marking time so faithfully. Little snail, you'll never know what happened outside as you dreamed. I watched your small hearts beating and called my love to come and see. Two, nomad of no fixed address, praise your paradox, your calcium elasticity. You who wander are not lost. Home is wherever you are right now. Everywhere you go is where you live. Three, let me sing of the snail and its loveliness, of the beauty I have ruined underfoot, wincing as though the pain were entirely mine. Knowing I could walk this city in a fatal rush, I have learned to step aside for you, have crouched even in the rain to move you further along your way in the line of your direction. And what is care but this to hold that which comes too soon to harm and set it on a safer path? To say, I'm sorry, simply, to do this and not dance, to signal the way to that place where the skin meets itself again, or failing that, where honey fills the wound's red mouth, solders a space left empty of love. Love, this way, we might say, this way, holding sometimes the other, sometimes the lonely self, until it can be said, love, we are home now. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful, Victoria. Thank you so much for accepting uh, the invitation to come into this space um, to create moments for um, tenderness and reflection. Um, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you'll find more information about Victoria um, in the follow-up email that we will send. We're including links to find out more about her work. There's lots of thank yous coming from the team behind the scenes. I don't know if you can see that, Victoria, um, but thank you so much. Uh, so we have time for some questions. Thank you all so much for making use of the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Victoria, I hope you won't. I, I hope you won't mind. I'm going to turn your video off. I, I would love to keep looking at you, um, and I'm going to invite back Shay, Eva, and Julia. Um, just want to let you guys know that Julia and I are sitting right next to each other, so we are going to try to navigate this this muting dance, this choreography, if you will, as best as we can. And there we go. We have Eva. Um, so we have a limited amount of time tonight, and it, it's worth reminding attendees that a great deal of work has gone into creating a report for you to read through, which answers some of the questions that were raised in the Q&A. So we've got three questions we're going to focus on to close out our time tonight. <clears throat> the first is, I love that Shay is talking about how this work links to other areas, for example, education. How can we encourage policymakers to think in a joined up way? The online safety bill, for example, aims to address symptoms, but it's not necessarily going to get to the causes. Plus, there's pushback from pressure groups to discussing race and racism in schools. I'm going to put that to you, Shay, 
Um, but Julia and, and Eva, please do feel free to come in and, and add to what Shay's saying. Thanks. Um, yeah, really good and important question, because I think if there's any example of silo working, not working well, it's the way our government departments are cut up and divvied up. And bear in mind for the last six years that we've been working on the online safety bill, we've seen through God knows how many prime ministers, but also the change of uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sports are now something else, which we still don't even know like where we sit. Um, and the inspiration that I would want to leave you with is looking at Australia, actually. They have an e-safety commissioner um, that is focused on looking at the safety and well being of all Australian citizens. And that will dovetail and weave in and overlap and intercept with many other areas. So looking at obviously tech and innovation, I wanted to support there being um, a growth of a tech tech, um, tech community. So there isn't a monopoly of by, by um, a few platforms. They are making sure that they're weaving in race and bringing in the indigenous and Aboriginal communities. Um, I really think that having an appointed person with a clear mandate and delegated powers to have that um, wide policy brief to see where harms and the causes of harms interweave is something that we could really um, take inspiration from. And we can start with the victims um, uh, commissioner. We could start with our police complaints commissioners. We could, there, there is ways in which we could start with giving um, a dedicated person an overview and a, and, a, and, in, and, and insights into online harms and how it intersects with other policy areas. That's really great. I, it just popped into my mind. I'm sorry, I don't want to derail. But <laughs> it's when you're mentioning kind of having a dedicated person within government to you know, uh, carry these policy decisions through. Is this anything like the kind of LGBT envoys we have or the all party parliamentary groups for particular areas? Uh, is that active as it relates to online safety? And is that something that would help from a policy perspective? Yeah, there are. I think there are APPGs. I think the question also mentioned how difficult it is to convince those that are in the tech rights digital space to care about race and gender. And I think glitches in a in a beautiful kind of like chaos of being in both the women women's gender feminist sector and the rights sector and doing a lot of convincing that the feminist movement and gender gender issues need to incorporate tech and also educating our kind of tech community of how they can incorporate um, uh, gender and race. And that's, that's why we partnered with TechScan because they had a willingness and a, an intention to want to improve their data set that they didn't look at just misogyny, but misogynoir. So I think there are people trying to do it um, uh, trying to bring sectors in and, and collaborate. I don't think all parliamentary party groups is the best way but it does allow for good relationship building and conversation because that's also really important important when we're doing resistance work right and we're doing change work is to make sure we're in really good community with people thank you eva i'm going to come to you we just got a great question um lots of according to this, a lot of mainstream white-led violence against women services have been speaking about the online safety bill and how it impacts all women but few have spoken about what we've discussed tonight and the work that that glitch is doing. They have some sort of seat at the table. What more can be done to get other organizations working in the space who are not acknowledging um, the specific harms against black women and online safety? Uh, what can we get them to do to kind of up their allyship ante? Well, thank you for answering, asking you such a difficult question. I think that's literally like, part of the work that we do at Glitch, right? Which is trying to figure out who are the partners that we want to work with? Who are the other people in the spaces that want to know and want to understand? I think when it comes to allyship, I kind of believe we kind of go back to the very similar answers that we've had before, right? Which is that there is a wealth of information out there. And I think part of the reason why we have this report today is to add more information where it has been lacking and add more evidence where it has been lacking and give people these opportunities to really learn from this space and take the time to, to learn and understand so that they can read, listen and learn and all those kind of things. And I think it is about understanding, not just about, I think it's multifold. I think you have to think about not just 
the work that you're putting out there, but also how you're working internally. So how are you making sure that the spaces that you work in are more inclusive? People talk about DEI and all those kind of things as well, but it's not just the statistics to, like, to tick off. It is thinking about what are these opinions and what are the, the experiences that you're missing and not understanding by not incorporating these voices and these things to understand and have these spaces to learn. So I think it's a difficult question that you asked me actually, and whoever asked that question, like, thank you for throwing me a ball. Um, but I think it's part of, honestly, the, the ongoing work that we have to do. And I think in terms of inviting people into this space, I think one thing that's really important is that we are always thinking about, okay, where are these different people? Where are they on their journey? And where are they? And where can we talk to you? And where can we meet you where, you, where you're at? So I also do think that there is, I guess, somewhat a responsibility of organizations like ours to question where are they at and how can we meet you where you're at? And that's always what we're thinking about when we're thinking about audiences. But I also do think that there's, there's a meeting on both sides that always needs to happen, which is that information is there and it is available and you can learn it and you can read it and therefore come with a teachable spirit. We talk inside Glitch about having a growth mindset. So I think that's really important that both sides of the organization, both sides or all sides come with really a growth mindset to this entire approach so that we can go towards the ultimate goal, really. Yeah, and there's a, that, it reminds me there's kind of a legacy from you know the, the feminist movements the various feminist movements of the 70s. I was just talking to someone the other day actually about um, you know, how these kind of fault lines are showing up in, in, present, in the present day and in present movements as well, right? That there continues to be black women led, black women focused organizations who are understanding that the work they do has a net positive impact on the lives of all women and keep trying to get other women to understand that if they could focus their efforts in a more intersectional and therefore capacious way that we would all get uh, a lot further um, together faster, more efficiently to Shay. Um, I'm gonna throw our last uh, question to Julia, which I have to find again. Uh, <laughs> how is uh, this, we, we've been talking tonight about, I think there's an assumption we're talking about big tech, big, well-established tech companies. It's Twitter, it's Facebook. Indeed, this research is kind of across these just five social media platforms. But there is another world of tech companies out there. What's Glitch doing about second generation um, tech companies? And actually explain second generation tech companies to people and then tell us why they're important to speak to and think about in this approach to online safety as well. Yeah, absolutely. So we um, we covered five companies in this research. Um, well, five platforms in this research. Um, but there is a lot of other sort of newer challengers in the in the tech industry space. Um, so, for example, with TikTok, Shay is on the Trust and Safety Council of TikTok and is engaging with them on, on their content moderation policies. And also we're in a specific moment now where there's a lot of challengers to sort of text-based platforms like Twitter, like Spill and Blue Sky and Mastodon, as a lot of users are leaving Twitter due to its kind of deteriorating online safety policies and other things that are going on. Um, and I think that's a really interesting moment for, for tech, advocacy, tech advocacy and for us to be in, because I think there's a, there's a chance for these newer platforms to not repeat the mistakes that the very first uh, companies that entered the market and were able to like gain a massive amount of users through network effects. And there's a chance there for them to build in safety by design. And I think there's a chance for um, us as users, us as advocates to kind of vote with our feet and push these companies to build the kind of safer online spaces, the spaces that have room for joy um, and, 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 and not this toxicity that we're tracking in these platforms. So I think that's something that we're going to be focusing a lot in our tech engagement going forward, as well as um, calling on all tech companies to be signing up to our calls to action. Jay, Julia, thank you so much. I'm gonna throw it back to Eva to close our event. Thank you so much, Josh, for holding that brilliant conversation and for holding the Q&A for us and for supporting with so much of the organization of this event as well. There is a definitely a very big shout out to go to Josh and also our comm teams at Glitch. Um, and thank you again so much, Victoria, for your beautiful poetry. I 
I specifically write down the quote and I, I was trying to write it down as you were saying it, but also trying to absorb it. Like their existence alone is evidence that invisible as they may be to others, they are by no means strangers to themselves. And I just found that so beautiful. And so it hit really the heart, I think, of what we're trying to say, which is sometimes about black women being invisible and we're trying to bring them to the light, but we're not visible to each other. And we're just all trying to make sure that we are seen and heard and our experiences are understood without necessarily needing every individual to speak to that. So thank you so much. That was beautiful to have. Um, and thank you again to everyone who has attended and for all the questions. I saw one person that said no questions, just in awe and drinking one of the best digital events I have attended. So thank you very much for that brilliant comment, drink responsibly, but um, thank you so much for that. So I'm going to be slowly drawing us to a close now. We've run slightly over. So thank you for staying throughout before you, do go I want you to remind you that this really is just the beginning it is a launch and there are so many things we can do so there are a few things that you can help us do to ensure that the internet is a safer place for black women so please head to our website to read the digital misogynoir report it is a useful and vital resource for those concerned with ending online abuse and as Dr Julia spoke to earlier your feedback about the report will be really really helpful to us in shaping how we talk about it so please feel free to email info at um, and let us know your thoughts about it in the various ways that we hope to communicate with you soon. When this particular webinar ends, a three question survey is going to pop up. Um, so I ask you really please to just hold on and take a few moments to answer those questions. The answers are completely anonymized. So please throw your answers at us there. They'll be really, really helpful for us. And then alongside sharing the report and talking to us about the report, please, or reading the report, please, make sure to share the report with your communities and your comrades and your colleagues and your friends and but also think about donating to glitch so i know that there were some questions about resourcing as well and this is something that you know is quite difficult to fundraise and i think there's a lot of work that we could be doing off the back of this in our communities so if it's one pound ten pounds please we'll be sending links to you all with the report with fundraising links so please do um donate off the back of this event um and then above all else uh, remember that your safety and your well-being online is not a pipe dream. That's what we're here for. It's not a nice to have. Uh, we have the power together to demand the change from tech companies and from our governments. And we really hope that you stay vocal with us in advocating for an internet is safe for Black women and therefore safe for all of us. So stay tuned, stay linked in for our next campaign. And um, I hope to see you all soon. Have a good evening and thank you for joining me. Bye.